I mean, this is the story of an American in Paris, isn't it, in part? And um, one of my other great loves is Henry James, and, and I have to say, uh, the, you know, the, the springboard for the plot is the ambassadors. I mean, I say that in the book, and um, I love this idea of, of this American of the time coming to this city of vice <laughs> and partial squalor. Um, and, and somehow being transformed by the experience. This is a period that absolutely fascinates me and I think it is genuinely a fascinating period because it, it's really the moment when the modern comes into being. Um, it's the moment the modern comes into being for various reasons. One is simply that you have a move from effectively a religiously based society to a secular one. So there's a kind of war going on between secular elements in France the republicanists and the, the uh, old Catholic hierarchy. Um, and that leads to all kinds of debate and discussion and change. Um, the other thing that's going on is that you really have, uh, if you like, the beginnings of a, of a scientific form of, of racism, in this case anti-Semitism, which, which is highlighted through the Dreyfus case and the language that it breeds around it, not only in politics um, and in the rabid right-wing press, but through what I call the mind doctors. As you know, I, I have a, I'm a historian of, of alienism, psychiatry and psychoanalysis and all of that. And this is the moment in France where um, you begin to have, or you, you have, um, psychological, psychiatric studies of what constitutes certain ethnicities. So there's a view about Americans and neurasthenia, there's a view about Jews and hysteria and so on. And I'm fascinated by all of these things coming into being at the same time in the same place. And, and I feel in, in all those ways it, it, it's, it's a quintessentially modern moment because we still have the, if you like, the legacy of all those uh, discourses. Also, it is the birth of a genuine argumentative democracy with a rampantly free press. There is no censorship after 79, 1879. And suddenly, you know, everything is said and everything is possible. <laughs> so, um, you know, think contemporarily. <laughs> and in the midst of that, of course, it's wonderful to weave a story. And the book is a story. I mean, I hope it's a rich story, but it is a story, it's a mystery. And all that. I mean, I've done a lot of research about the period, and um, historical and literary, cultural, history of women, I mean, all of that. Um, I also know the city very well. Um, and on top of that, it's a city in which I spent my very earliest childhood. And so, in a sense, Paris has a kind of magic for me that all those places that you've been to and lost <laughs> have. And I have many gradations of, of Paris inside myself. One of them is, is, is this historical one. That I'm, I'm not as old, I'm quite old, but I'm not as old as the Belle Époque. <laughs> but nonetheless, that that um, I have this this kind of you know political, literary, historical Paris in me. I also have the Paris I lived as a child, and with all its smells and you know all that that tactile feeling that you have places that you haven't necessarily even been able to speak, <laughs> but it's there. And and then I have you know Paris that I know now and 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 love. So um, all those things come together and and. Um, yeah, and I've written about Paris before. I mean, I've done fictions set in Paris before because for me it's both a real and a very mythical place. You have to know that I once wrote a PhD about Proust. <laughs> and I, you know, my, my, my feeling about this is if you can't do Proust, <laughs> Then, which I can't, um, and particularly of that period, then, then mystery is a good as way to go as any. And I love thrillers, I love mystery, I love things that are uh, pacey and, and um, actually allow you... I think one of the great things about uh, you know, the genre of fiction is that it allows you to get a lot of very interesting material into places where you don't necessarily notice as a reader that it is. It's not hard work. Um, and you, you actually assimilate a lot of what's going on. Um, I mean, I know Edinburgh through Rankin and Rebus. <laughs> I don't, don't know it through Hume, although I've read Hume as well. You know, I mean, it, 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 so it's that kind of thing. And I've, I've written um, thrillers before, and, and I love um, writing them. I also love reading them, as I said. It's just before the last American election. And I don't know if you remember, but I remember distinctly, it was the time when everything seemed to be terrible. Uh, for women. I mean, there was so-called legitimate rape had reared its head. And 
you know, congressmen were speaking about rape as being legitimate. <laughs> um, uh, there, there, books had come out about sexual slavery, um, grooming scandals in Rochdale. I mean, you know, things seemed to be going from bad to worse. And I'm, I'm not really a very good um, complainer. I like analysis, but I don't like complaining. I said, well, let's do something. I mean, you know, here we are, uh, women of a very certain age, <laughs> and we still remember that, that what is quickly at that point seem to have been forgotten, which is that there has been a women's movement several times round now. And and it's important with women's history that, that one doesn't allow it to go too much into abeyance because it's so easy for it to slip away and and all the things that have been won to, to sort of crumble. So we thought, we'll do a book. We'll, we'll get 50 women. And I came up with, I said, let's do 50 shades of feminism, never mind all this sort of, you know, masochistic, slightly... Um, well, tawdry. I mean, I, I don't want to, you know, I don't, I don't, what 50 million women like is fine with me, but there's a way in which uh, Fifty Shades domesticates the pleasures of violence. And, and that's tricky for people who actually experience violence domestically um, without the pleasure attached becomes normalized in a sense. Anyhow, so, but I thought we could reuse that title which had so many people and uh, uh, loving it and, and put a different gloss on it. And the whole book was an attempt to get women of all kinds, um, all ages, or as many as we could get into 50, to very, very quickly create something which said, look, you know, we too think feminism lives through us. Um, it is important. And I think a lot of people around the world were feeling that about then because it was a kind of nadir point. And as soon as the new year came, things started to shift and change. I mean, you know, women were saying, well, look, we don't want lots and lots of television porn. We don't want to this. I mean, we, you know, there, was, there were voices speaking out. And now we even have our political parties, even the Tories saying, let's get some more women up there. And David Cameron has declared himself a feminist. I hope this is true. <laughs> I say it here and now, this is a challenge. <laughs> we probably value writers very much, but at the same time, we love to mock. And England has a great uh, tradition of mockery. And so we, we mock while we also go to festivals. And, and um, I, think, I think reading is not on the down. I think people read in all kinds of ways now. They may read online, they may read in book form, um, but there's an awful lot of reading going on. Um, I, think, I think the English are quite good readers, and I think also the English are great believers and the British are great believers in free, I've got to include the Scots here, great believers in free expression as well, and um, the importance of keeping the terrain of the word open and alive and that's very important to writers of course but I think it's equally important to readers including newspaper readers um, and that's I think what we also try to do with pen I mean one of the many we've fought many battles in my time one one um, was against the incitement to religious hatred law which um, of course had it been followed and was probably put forward with, with all kinds of good intentions, but with the law of unintended consequences would have caused even more trouble uh, than it had, had it actually gone through. And we managed to stop that and, and, and say, look, religious authority has always been univocal. It wants its followers to speak one tongue. And if you enshrine that in law, then you will have war between the very plural, uh, in the plural, very plural country that Britain is. Um, so we, we, we fought that battle and then we, we um, instigated this, this um, research and reform of the libel laws which is still going on and um, all the political parties signed up to reform at the last election. We have yet to see it but I think it's on the way. <laughs> there have been various bills put through and, and it's almost there. I think it would be wonderful in terms of books themselves if more politicians read. I mean, you know, there used to be a time, she said as an old lady, <laughs> that politicians did read. I mean, I remember Dennis Healy, you know, meeting him at literary festivals and we, we talked about books. I think Ed Miliband reads quite a lot. I mean, this, this is not a party political broadcast, but he actually, you know, he, I used to meet him up at Hay and he loved books. And, he was at Edinburgh this year. Um, it would be nice if more politicians actually read books, and not only books about politics, if they read fiction, because I think you know, the broader and more widely focused 
in terms of people's experience our politicians are, the better they are as our representatives. <laughs> Otherwise, they're merely, um, you know, party hacks or, or um, I don't know, they, 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 get, they can get very narrow like some American politicians are. We were thrilled at Penn <laughs> when Obama took office because he was first of all a writer <laughs> and he'd written these brilliant books and, and you know, I, th I think that uh, that shows the, the kind of intelligence that he has, that, that he actually values the word 